Running the event today is Gary Jinx. Uh, he has 25 years of corporate R&D, uh, systems, engineering, business development, um, working on combat vehicles, EVs, robotics, IoT concepts to production. Uh, Gary is also the president of GLJ Group, and they've captured over 350 million for clients. And Gary also is the founder of South Valley Angels, which led 4.5 million in funding, and CEO of Skill of Stream, um, which uh, MVP launched uh, March 1st of 2021. Gary has 12 years of working with and building Silicon Valley incubators. He's built first corporate innovation center in Saudi Arabia. And, and, and has worked directly with well over a thousand startups. Gary, you can take the floor now. All right, thanks a lot, Hugh. So now, many of you though, if you're launching a startup, you are going to be by default, particularly if you're an army of one right now, you're by default going to be the CEO of the company. And the secret to that, as Andrew Carnegie says, surround yourself with people smarter than yourself, okay? Now, there's two types of uh, CEOs in the scheme of things. There's visionary CEOs and there's hired guns. Um, in the corporate world, it's very common for corporations to go out and get a hired gun as a specific CEO because of what they do and how they turn around companies or whatever their philosophy is. In the case of the startup, it's been primarily geared around visionary. A visionary CEO, your Steve Jobs, your Bill Gates, Mark Andreessen, these type of folks. So what is a CEO's job? I like to make these as engaging as we can as we go, make them kind of fun a little bit. So what's a CEO's job? Who wants to throw some ideas out there? No ideas? Um, Happy to share. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Emily? Oh, I was going to say um, that the CEO is is responsible for the for the vision and the strategic direction of the um, of the company. I and like where... that. I like that. <laughs> that is definitely one of vision. If the CEO doesn't bring the vision, then who does? OK, direction and vision. We'll categorize those as, as, as one item. What's number two? From my experience, just the combination of owning the vision at every level, um, as far as knowledge and mm -hmm. application, mm -hmm. and then understanding, you know, the, the most nimble way to execute on all fronts, which is everything. Oh, okay. I'm not sure it. about so, that. That might be putting a lot of a lot a lot onto a CEO. Well, early wanna... stage companies, um, yeah, that begins to you know okay. narrow in scope. Okay, now you could list a few things, and we're going to talk about some of these. But CEOs sure. fundamentally have two jobs, and they and one of those everybody nailed that vision. They have to bring the vision. If not, then the company is just a list of people, and who's who's got the vision? Where are they going? What are they going to do? Oh well, we make a product. Here's our product. So they got to bring vision and direction. So Emily, you're on on board with that one. The second thing CEOs do is they raise money constantly. You're either raising money from private investment here in the startup model, or you're getting people on board. You're selling shares. You've got, you know, you got all your shareholders to keep happy. They're always doing that. And technically, they'll hire other people around them to do that. But in simple terms, the one we're going to talk about today is more on the vision and direction. Now, I do want to talk about culture a little bit. It's no less important. But the CEO will inherently, by default, set the culture, basically by walking the walk, as they say. It's difficult to create a culture. You can create a vision. You can raise money. Cultures are something that's, that tend to happen over time. And they happen over time based on the leadership. Uh, good leadership will end up with good culture. Bad leadership will inherently end up with bad culture. Um, but anyway, those are what the CEO's job is, the first two primarily. And can one also say? Yeah, go that, ahead. Can one also say that the CEO is the public face of the company? Um, in the case of when you uh, say, for example, have a startup and you are the um, 
you know, you're the sole operator, uh, you know, for the moment. You are also the public face of the company. Absolutely. Yeah. You are the face. The good and the bad. Okay, so now what makes a good CEO? Well, there's probably 10,000 books out there on what makes a good CEO. So let's just grab this list from Forbes. It's as good as any. Uh, most of them are similar. But this is as good as any. I'm fine with these. It's got a, some key things on there. Vision being one. Realistic optimism. Hmm. Somebody has to be realistic, right? Now, to this list, I, I would actually like to add these two. Credibility and confidence. I think uh, in the early stage of the startup, those are uh, as critical uh, personality traits as well. Now, we're going to spend most of today talking about communication and vision, not going to go into the details of curiosity and organization, all those stuff. We're going to talk about number five and number seven. So talk like a CEO. What do we mean by talk like a CEO? So having listened to way more pitches than I could even think about, the, what we're talking about is speaking strategic, not tactical. Most entrepreneurs come in and are extremely tactical. And there's reasons for that. One, you're building a product. You're spending all day at the tactical level, making sure that product does what it's supposed to do for your customers and users of that product. And that's where you spend most of your time. And many of you may not have come out of the ranks of a CEO. You may be a technical person or a business person that have the idea and are putting it together. So it's more natural. It takes a while to learn how to speak tactically. But your failure to do this has a couple of ramifications as an investor when you're doing it with investors. One is if you're talking tac tactical, then you sound like all your competitors that have come in and pitched prior to you because you're all solving the same tactical problems. Oh, it's fragmented. It's slow. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. And, and at the tactical level, you're all solving the same problems. So at the strategic strategic level, it's easier to keep you clear on what on who you are. So that gets to selling your product to customers and your vision and business case to investors. As an investor, we may never use your product. I may not know your product well enough to know if it's better than anybody else's product, but we do know a good business case. Do understand what what a good idea is and whether it fits in the fundamental box that we're in. In the next meeting, we're gonna come out and we are going to then bring a specialist who will understand your idea in detail. So again, we're interested in the first meeting, particularly when you're doing your first pitch, is to your business case, so that you're just trying to get to the next meeting, not educate us on everything about your product. So if you can, as a CEO, if you kind of think that you, in, in the concept of you have a clear vision, you see the future, you know what's going to be going on in the future. And because of that, you see an opportunity and you have a solution and plan to capture that opportunity and the people of which to do so. In simple terms, that's, that's your CEO message. Today, when, on, when, when entrepreneurs pitch to us, their message is, we have a great product that's solving a great problem in demand. And that may, in fact, be the case. But what's going on in the future where you're, you're relevant? And so that's where the vision comes into play. So what are investors looking for in a CEO? Who wants to throw some ideas? Who's gone out and pitched or had an investor say what they're looking for in a CEO? What was that? <clears throat> They're looking for a return on their investment. Ah, they want a re an investor that's going to give them a return. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else are they looking for an investor? You know, statistically, they say most investors are, you know, not most investors, but most CEOs historically have been over six feet tall for male CEOs. So is, is that important? Are they looking for tall CEOs? Is that, ah, that part of it? Uh, domain expertise. Okay, there you go. 
we're gonna we can even make it simpler than that this is gonna be another one of those lists because there's a bunch of books out there that you can read on how what what they think they want so according to paul meeks this is what he believes investors are looking for in a ceo hey gary can you just make me co-host and then i'll, I'll mute anyone who's not um sounds like plan. let's see can i do that make co-host there you go here we go yeah it's kind of bouncing around a little bit there thanks okay so according to paul meek like it this is his list and i'm fine with this list too just like the forbes list on the previous slide it's it's as good as anybody's but this is really what they're looking for to, when the CEO pitches. They're looking for leadership. Will somebody follow you? Will you be able to build a team? Will you be able to raise additional funding? Do you, do you bring that air of confidence, that passion, that charisma? Um, you can wear the Samsung t-shirt or not. Um, but ultimately, this is really what investors are looking for. And for many of us, that's an unfair advantage. For one, I'm not six feet tall. Um, it, it took me years to be able to talk like a CEO and so forth. And many of us are just not comfortable in a CEO position and our skill sets don't align that. So as a company, what does that mean for you as a company? Does that mean the CEO has to be the speaker that does the pitches? Not necessarily. As a company, you need to put the right people in, in place and put them in the, in the position. But this is ultimately it, what will happen. If you do a pitch to investors and we get done at the end of that, say, boy, you know, I like what they're doing, but man, I'm just not sure that's the CEO that's gonna, you know, that's gonna hit it out of the park. Um, and that's kind of the squishy part and the fair or unfair part of, of looking for funding. Um, is particularly at the angel level, it's not a one plus one equals three. There's a lot of gut feel that goes along at the angel level. Um, again, not all of us are born with this high degree of confidence and passion and charisma that can walk in and capture a room within minutes. Um, so we have to work at it. Any questions on, on, on that ask, you know, just the basic simplicity of that? Yeah, go ahead. So how can how can someone tell? If oh, we can tell. You can tell. I mean, everybody <laughs> can tell. Everybody knows when they start talking. So, for example, I spent 20 years as a systems engineer. Um, and one of the areas that a lot of technical entrepreneurs struggle with is they, a lot of engineers are not comfortable in a room full of people talking about business and asking for money. They're great talking about their product and they'll, they'll talk about their product all day. They love to talk about their product. They're comfortable there. But many of them, soon as they get over and they're, well, what's your go-to-market strategy? What are you gonna do? What kind of partnership relationships are you looking at? What do you think, what's your valuation? And all these questions come out and they get real uncomfortable because they're out of their comfort zone. Um, and uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing, but the investors are, are seeing how that works and how you respond and what's going on. And at the end, sometimes it's simple to, it can simply be that, it, you know, they just didn't think you were the right one to, you know, now there's a difference between confidence and being cocky or overconfident. You know, sometimes we will ask you some hard questions just to see if you fold like a lawn chair, or do you stand there and hold your own and say, well, I'd have to push back on that, Mr. or Mrs. Investor. I'm not sure that's how we see the market, or I'm not sure that's the way that's really happening. Um, so anyway, there you go. So what is the best way to ask for money? What's the best way to ask for money? Well, we know why you're here. So just ask for the money. Uh, is, you know, Most of the time, most of us grow up where, and, and this is around the world. It's cultural around the world. Asking for money somewhat indicates that there was a failure somewhere. Why are you asking for money? Uh, but in this world, we know why you're here. Um, you're here to ask for money and we're here to give you money. We actively, no investor is meeting because they don't want to give you money. They're meeting with you because they're hoping you're the one they can give money to because they have money they want to give to somebody or somebody's. 
So everybody at the table is there for the same reason. So there's no reason to be shy. Um, just let us know what you want and, and, and we can go from there. Unless you're in an open environment like our open demo nights, oops, wrong button there. Unless you're on our open demo nights, then we can't ask for money because the uh, SEC doesn't like that. Okay, keep it on going from there. Now let's talk a little bit about pitching and pitch decks. Um, we kind of got the fundamentals of a CEO and what, what people are looking for. And again, it's a learned skill. You don't just wake up in the morning and know how to do it. You just have to think about it. So a lot of times when we do one-on-ones and I'm working with entrepreneurs and, and we're going through programs and so forth, one of the things we'll harp on is to try to keep picking you up and get you out of the details. So when you get too far in the details, you know, I'll, I'll stop right there and say, oh, 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 let's get back up. Let's talk like the CEO. Because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a learned skill set. Pitching and pitch decks. So let's start at the very beginning. So how you see yourself, when you kick off your startup, you see yourself as the best idea and the best solution. I mean, you've been working on this baby for a while now. You put your blood and sweat in this, right? You're the best value, best price. You bring the most benefit to the table. And you have to look at that. Just like somebody said earlier, you need to own your vision statement and you need to own how you see the vision because it's driving in theory everything you're doing. You have to own that you have the best product or solution and why. However, as an investor, that's not how we see you. All of you in our lobby have the best product, the best idea. And in many cases, it is better than what's out there today. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the best opportunity. So as a CEO, you don't spend your time selling your product. So if I'm the CEO of Sony, I don't come to a meeting and just spend my time selling TVs. I spend my time selling Sony as a corporation and why Sony is a great corporation. And that's what you're doing in the, particularly the first meeting with an investor. You're selling your, your idea, your company, your team, but you're selling the opportunity. You're the best opportunity. If you can get us the highest return in the shortest amount of time with the least amount of risk, we'll probably write you a check, assuming it's legal. Not that you have a better widget. The widget is necessary because it has to be better than, you know, there has to be some, some meat on the bones there. But in the initial discussions we're having and the talking of the CEO, it's about the opportunity and why we should be listening. And an opportunity is a perfect combination of a vision and a plan. I have a vision. I know it's that that light at the end of this road, and this road is perfectly straight. I know exactly how to get there. Now, let's talk about raising money and what that looks like. So these are stats from an average seed raise. These stats come out of the Silicon Valley. So your mileage may vary depending where you're located. But they're probably pretty typical. And these are from a couple of years ago, but they probably don't change much, but a minor percent anytime. So those folks that got funded, they started by contacting 58 investors. They met with 40 of them. The average funding they raised was 1.3 million. And it took them 12 and a half weeks to close once they found a lead investor. So when we have startups come say, hey, we're looking for funding, we'd like to get funded by July. My first question is, do you have a lead investor? And if the answer is no, the odds of that happen. Does that mean you can't get some funding? Yes, but your odds of closing that round by July or something. Okay, now let's talk about the, math, the, the, the pitch deck, the all important pitch deck, right? How many pages should your pitch deck be? Who's got us some numbers for me? What have you Googled? Nobody's Googled how many pitch, how many pages should be in a pitch deck? Between eight and 12. Eight and 12. That's a good call because 10 falls right in the middle of that. And uh, so I'm going to let that, that, we'll go eight to 12 as an answer. The answer for the average pitch deck size was 19.2 pages. Now, I have a, I have a, 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 a hypothesis on why the, pitch deck arrived at 10 pages. If you look at the two industry standards, the Guy Kawasaki and the Sequoia Capital, they've both been around for decades, probably 20 years anyway. 
And they both coincidentally have 10, 10 items listed that you're supposed to talk about. And I think that's how it became 10 pages. Well, anyway, 19.2. Now, for all, those, all, of, all of those out there now that are doing your pitch decks and getting ready for this, and you've done 400 revisions and you spent about 300 hours working on this, the average investor is going to spend three minutes and 44 seconds looking at your pitch deck. So now, what questions should you be asking me? What, what questions should be cut surfacing? What are they looking at? Are they oh, ask? there you go. What did they spend their 344 looking at? Because you better get that part right. So for all of you technical people, here's what they did. They spent the least amount of time on the solution. By far. Yet, as a presenter, you spent most of your time on the solution. Where did they spend all their time? Well, obviously the financials. It's all about the numbers. We're all in it for the money. If the numbers don't work, then the rest of your slides are irrelevant. <laughs> so there you go. So the solution was the least important thing. Why is that? Well, right now we know that your solution fits in a box and it looks like a logical solution down the road, or it doesn't. We'll figure out the details on the solution in the next meeting. Right now, we're just checking the box and says, yeah, it looks like a good idea. It looks like it's headed in the right direction. Done. So now let's fill the gap in. Oh my gosh, the second least important thing was the problem, which again, you entrepreneurs spend a lot of time on the problem and solution. Not so, financials. Do the numbers work? Does the team look like they can execute? And then there's competition and why now? And those are what we call part of the opportunity and conceptualizing your idea. And that is what, how do you fit in the competition? And the most important is why now? Market size is a little bit of opportunity. Most important, if the financials work, the team can execute, you fit well in the com competition and the timing's right. That's a biggie right there. If those things are all in place, then probably everything else could be fixed if it's not. So there you go. So all of you tactical people, I know, don't, don't be too disappointed that your solution wasn't the top of the list. Any questions on that? Yeah, you said you're looking for 10 things or 10 questions. What are those? Well, if you look at most of them, like Sequoia's first thing, everybody says you got to solve a problem, you know, and uh, let me rattle these things. Gosh, I've been looking at them for so long, I should go knock them off. Uh, you got to you gotta have a process. Normally, it's market size, a problem, market size, solution. Oh, gosh, I have to think what they are now. I can't even think of them. See, I do it in yeah. a different format. I, I think the way everybody should be doing it, if you want to differentiate, differentiate yourself, there's a better way to do it. And that's do it like, like we're talking here. Start with a vision. Here's a vision. Here's, the, here, here's a vision. I see an opportunity. Here's the problems I got to solve to capture that opportunity. Here's the solution that we have that does that. Here's the plan to do that. Here's the team that can execute it. Here's what it's going to cost. Here's what we need. You can make your check out too. There you go. So that's a method, an order that I kind of like as an investor. Um, but uh, I'm trying to remember. I might even, do I have it in here? Oh, here we go. I've got them right here. Good question. There they are. If I just remembered my pitch, I'd, I've only done this so many times. There you go. There they are. Company, problem, solution, why now, market size, competition, product, business development, team, and financials. As an investor, we really don't care what order they're in. But you do need to touch base on this aspect in some manner or another. The biggest problem today, and if those of you that went to the webinar yesterday that we talked about conceptualizing your idea, is that the biggest problem today is entrepreneurs spend their whole time looking at a problem and not down the road. Where it is, does it fit? Where are the trends going? Um, you know, and that's that's a critical piece that's missing in many pitch decks. And market size is not an opportunity. The biggest number is why now? 42% of startups fail because of timing. And there's the one I just rattled off, the, the precision innovation piece of that. Build your message from the, from the vision, how you see the future. The future of the automobile will be electric. That puts us in the $200 billion electric vehicle market. It's growing like crazy. Here's all the stats that say that you better get out of the way because it's coming. And that puts this, our vertical market, we're going after two, two markets, chargers, chargers and batteries, because every electric vehicle has to have them. So that's the kind of message you want. Build from your, 
your vision, back it up with numbers and facts. Too often we see things like a problem that says, oh, well, this is fragmented. Uh, you know, and that's nice. But anything you can do to back it up, because in most cases, you're as a CEO, you're simply better, faster, cheaper. So as a CEO, you don't need to get into the details of the aspect of it, maybe from a customer's perspective, just simply the stats. Today, the standard is 10. In two years from now, that, that, that standard needs to be one. If you can't be done in one, then you're, you're, you're not a viable product for the future. So back it up with numbers, better, faster, cheaper. And for most people, you don't have to sell the investor that you've invented something. Very few startups have invented. In fact, I would say that the last thing it invented in the Silicon Valley was probably the chip in the 70s. Apple didn't invent the computer and Google didn't invent the browser and Facebook didn't invent social media and on and on and on. Very little invention happens. But innovation, that's what gets funded. Better, faster, cheaper. And you should be able to measure that. All right, now let's talk about your vision. Who wants to give me their, try to give, give who wants to give me their, your vision statement? And, and, and if, it's, if, it's, if, if it needs to work, we'll fix it right here on the spot. Wait, I heard somebody. Nobody's got a vision. Which would be an example. I'll give it a shot. All right, go for it. All right, go ahead, John. All right, John. All right. My vision of the future is when two thirds of infertile couples can be guided to pregnancy by their family practice or OBGYN using our platform without the need for expensive IVF. Okay, okay. So there's a goal, not necessarily a vision, but it's a goal. So let's say that the future of infertility will be what? Where's the future going? Will it be something I can do it, I can address at home? Personally, so yeah. so, yeah. Uh, so that's what we want to look at. So in the area of trends, everything from the hospitals are moving into homes a lot. So think about from, and you started right because uh, I know that you were, you have heard this. So we see a world where the future of will be. So try it. See if you can come up with it. Get, don't worry about two thirds of this and on your platform and all that stuff is envisioned. Simply the future will be. Uh, how you want to lead that off? Try again, John. Okay. The future of infertility care is at home uh, with, with your smart device connected to your family doctor. Okay. You can leave it as simple as just at home. Oh, okay. And now then you can bring that down. So let's just say you believe it's going to be at home. Okay. Now, we're going to talk, hold that thought for a little bit, and we're going to talk about the opportunity. So where, because of that, you, where do you see an opportunity? Not Tam, Sam, Sam. Those are not opportunities. So we want to think of it. So that puts you in what market? In, in, in uh, fertility market, right? Right. Okay, so you have a TAM for that, correct? Yes. Okay, so you can throw a, a number out there that puts you in that market. So now I have a vision. This is going to go to home. That's going to put us in this market. Now I have a check that says I'm addressing market size. What's the number you throw around there? What's your big number you like to throw around? 5.1 billion. 5.1 billion. Now you're in the 1.5 billion Philly market. Very good. So now you can identify a little bit in this opportunity why that's a growing. Why is that a good market to be in? just for beginners, okay? You don't have to answer that right now. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, think about you, the opportunity in the form of your vision, validate your vision. Why do you believe it's moving home? And there's a lot of reasons you can do that'll come up with that, we'll touch on in a minute. Level three, what are your market segments? What are you going after and why? So now you have a vision that infertility care is moving into the home. And that market right now is X and is expected to grow by Y between now and 2025. And here are some trends of why we believe it's moving the home. Because there's testing, there's various things that are happening that are making equipment much more affordable. You can go to CVS and places like that, rent stuff that you would never have been able to do in, in the past. 
So all these things are coming on. And now that brings you down to your market segment. So what, how do you define your market segment, John? Uh, that, that's why I said the two thirds. Well, I mean, the two thirds. So, so are you selling to, is your market segment selling con consumer, business to consumer, business to business? Or are you selling to hospitals, doctors? What, what, what's your market segment? Who, if you've got your money today, who's the first person you'd call to borrow? Um, physician groups. Physician groups. Okay, uh, there you go. Third party payers, hospital uh, networks, and uh, individual patients. Okay, so we'll go with those just as an example that those are your market segments and your customer personas of which you're going to design your go to market for. Okay. So that is the methodology of being able to lay down and think about and talk about the opportunity a little bit and what space you're in versus showing up uh, with just a, a Tam and a Sam and a Psalm that says it's a, it's a, what was that again? 54, a uh, $5.1 billion market, which in itself yeah. inside doesn't define an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense on the opportunity? Think about it in kind of a level, not that your pitch deck needs to be three different levels, but what you want to do is gather stats. Why is the market good? Understand these, why that's going on. Then be able to bring that together and communicate it at a very high level that demonstrates you as the CEO understand what the opportunity is at a high level. Now, as a CEO and as a presenter, you want to stay at the high levels when you're speaking on these topics. Um, so a strategic problem of capturing the opportunity. That is, is, a, is the problem to capture that isn't necessarily a customer problem. So John, using you as an example, since we had that, what would you say is the strategic problem you need to solve? If you don't solve this problem, then you can't capture the opportunity. How do, um get it out of being focused in specialty clinics and empowering the primary care physicians. Okay, so in your eyes, the, if you can just get it out of the clinics and, and, and get it into the hands of primary care physicians, you believe if you can come up with something that does that, then you will absolutely be able to capture the, the full opportunity. Correct. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'm just going to go with that. Okay, so now if that's the strategic problem, what are the pro what are today's problems that you would have to solve? Just one or two of those. And then what are the real problems of tomorrow's problems? So again, you don't wanna to spend too much time on the tactical problem aspect of that. Uh, you can come back and answer some of those details later. So what is the, you know, what is the key today's problem you have to solve in order to accomplish your strategic problem? Okay. The uh, lack of knowledge, time, and um, uncertainty of uh, return on investment of, of the primary care doctors. Okay, so this problems you're solving today is the primary care physician's problem. Right, because they're- Okay, they're, okay so you're yeah. solving the primary care problem. Okay, now the second part of that, what, what are, what's coming up tomorrow? What does the future look like with, with AI coming and new tools? Do you need to be compatible to the fire network in the, that's coming out in the medical world? Uh, it, yes, it uh, becomes more autonomous, uh, less need for actual physician interface. Right, but that's not the problem. The problem is somebody's gonna come out of, uh, so fire is my understanding is gonna become the Microsoft of the medical world. It's gonna be the operating system and backbone for the hospitals and everything across the country. So I, mm -hmm. with their startups we work with, they're already becoming certified fire compliant, mm -hmm. okay. which means they, they can be able to share their data amongst hospitals and so forth. AI is coming, things are coming, but those are the future state that you have to be aware for. There's a lot of technology. We don't know what's coming yet. You have to make sure you're compatible with it if that's the case. Exactly. Okay. So anyway, oops, sorry about that. So the idea of the CEO is keep these at high level. Don't bury yourself down into the weeds of the product. You want to just get the point across that there's three strategic, there's a couple of key strategic problems and there's a couple, you know, solutions that have to be. Again, like we talked earlier, better, faster, cheaper. There's metrics, you know, and statistics to support these things. 
It's today it's 10, tomorrow it has to be one. Today it's in the hospital, tomorrow it has to be at home. It has to be done with a simple device that can be done by a person. You know, and today it's done by a doctor, tomorrow it has to be a, a wearable, like just push a button and all, everything happens or whatever the case may be in your example, John. Now, here's another area as a CTO, as a CEO, is talking about the product. This is an area that in a pitch deck, everybody dies down into the weeds. So these are the four questions we want to know as an investor, the simplest term in the first meeting. Question one, what is it? And question two, what does it do? May be obvious based on what it is. So you may only have a what is it, how does it do it, why is it important? But these are one line sentences that your grandmother could understand. So who wants to tell me about their product and answering these four questions? I'm happy to take a stab at this one. Colleen, give it a shot. Oh, excellent. So what is it? A cancer care management platform. Oh, sorry about that. I was turning a piece of paper over to make notes. I missed oh, that. Okay. One more. Go ahead. Okay. So it is a cancer care management platform. Okay. Um, what does it do? It collects daily health data. How does it do it? It works through your phone and computer. And why is it important? Cancer care is increasingly moving into the home. So health data that could be crucial to outcomes is lost. Okay. And, and so that's good. I think you can tighten up the, uh, I, I like most of that. You can probably get stronger on the, on the last one, but that was pretty I'm good. That was good. Uh, and I think that uh, you did a great job on that. Um, can you, can I you think, just, I, what I totally missed was you said, I think you could tighten up something. Oh, the, the, your, 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 why is it important? Um, it, I think you, you hit it good. I think the moving in your home is good. And what was the last one you said? Um, I said, cancer care is increasingly moving into the home. So health data that could be crucial to outcomes is lost. Um, I probably would, I probably wouldn't get that, but I think it's moving into the homes and something else lost is kind of tactical. I think you can come up with something a little better than that, but I like the rest of it. The rest okay. of it was, was pretty clear. Um, the one I didn't like too much was the third one, which is how does it do it? It does it by phone and computer. What does that mean? Do I plug that in? Do I have a USB on the back of my neck? Do I plug that in and run it on my phone? So break that down in a little bit more of what, do, what really goes on. Okay. Uh, on how it does it. Is there an IP activity going there? Is there an algorithm? What? What? Yeah. So it's app based. If there's a, there's a, an app that you can use on your mobile phone, and then we've got a platform that you can access through your computer. But does it? So for example, does it gather data from? Uh, so we're going back again, like with right. uh, John Early, does it gather data from devices and then feed that so that there's an instant messaging between you and the physician? Yeah. I mean, we've talked. Yes. So so that's what we want to look at is is that that key piece of it not that, sure it happens on a phone it's mobile but if it's an app it probably is mobile anyway by default okay can you so, say that so it it gathers data from devices and also people right it's it's so there's the human input component yeah so you already get you already told me that it's 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 collecting data okay how does it do that in a particular manner it can do it through what does it do through wearables does it collect it from you know a little bit this is probably one of the hardest parts for most entrepreneurs because you think your product in a big scale picture and it's hard to dial this down. But you're doing pretty good because I think when we initially talked about this, it was a little longer. So good job on yes. that. Okay. So just think Thank about you. that a little bit and, and so forth. And so everybody needs to be able to do that and try to do that um, because it can be much more compelling. If I'm a technical person and I truly understand the cancer arena, then I will probably know some specific questions to ask that I, and so forth. But if I'm just a physician and I don't necessarily know the details, I may understand the fundamentals at high level. It can be more compelling. So I'll give you an example that I like to do, which is, so we talked about, if I was going to pitch a product to you, I'm going to pitch to you the, the future of transportation. What is it? It's a bicycle. What does it do? As you would expect, it moves you from point A to point B efficiently. How does it do it? It does it with your own human power. Why is that important? It requires no external energy source and will always be the most efficient form of transportation, period. Now, if I'm saying that to an investor in an elevator or we had a one minute or two minutes to talk about that, there's probably some compelling. 
wow, the most efficient, so forth. Now, I may have heard of a bicycle, but notice I didn't talk about shifting gears or seats or carbon fiber or frame geometry or, or derailers or spokes or chains or tires. We went into none of that detail, but I bet I could get called back for another meeting. So now I come back to the second meeting and guess who's sitting in the room? Somebody from Specialized who knows bicycles inside and out. And now we can talk about my product in detail. And that specialist will come back to me as an investor and say, hey, they've got a great bicycle or whatever the case. So keep that in mind as you're talking. Again, talking like a CEO. Now, again, as a CEO, some of the other pieces of it aren't even your product. The real thing has to do with why you. Oh, yeah, by the way, we also make a good product. But we have, a, we have an IP or not. We have a business model that's uniquely different. Maybe you're the next Airbnb or the next Uber. You've done something that allows it. You have a team and things put together that are, that are novel. You have partnerships that give you an unfair advantage. You know, there's methodologies that you're doing. These become the why you. And in many cases, they're almost more important than the product itself. <clears throat> Any questions on that, on problems, solutions? Again, the problem and the solution isn't necessarily your problem. The problem is that your product, you have a problem, there's a solution that has to be achieved in the future to do that. And here's your product that you believe accomplishes all that. Okay. Competitive landscape. This is another area in pitching uh, that tends to, to not work as well. <clears throat> and it's also an area. So the opportunity and the competitive landscape are two areas where the investors, when you're talking to them, will show up with a preconceived, potentially biased opinion of how you fit in the marketplace and how the opportunity looks. They may be right, they may be wrong, they may you know, just disagree with you, but they're gonna show the bias. So both the competitive landscape and the opportunity are where you need to sort of hold the investor's hands so they arrive at the end of the discussion seeing it the way you do. And we're talking opportunity in most cases, this is where your vision comes to rest. You have a vision, you saw an see the opportunity, you know how to solve it, here's the solution to do that, and here's how you fit in the competitive landscape. When you're done here, all of this is based on one common thread, which is how you see the future. After this, you're gonna start planning and financials and the mechanics of doing it. But right now, we're looking at how you define the future market, not a product. Again, as a CEO, you're focused on the company, not necessarily the product. The product's just awesome. Just, you're a CEO, it's always gonna be awesome, okay? So, this isn't the chart where you have all the X's and, and all the features against your competitors. So let's think about your competitive environment in a different manner. Not is your product better. Let's think about it in a matter of history. For most of you today, unless you're doing inventing something brand new that doesn't exist and has never been anything like it, then you're doing better, faster, cheaper as, as a business, okay? And your product is, is gonna be the chart that you're looking at with your X's, that's critical for you internally to ensure you're building the best product possible. And it does compare on a product to product basis. But we're gonna look at history. Everything you're doing today can be done today. I mean, everything you're presenting in your product that's gonna be ready in two years, I can do what you're doing today. I may not be able to do it exactly the way you're gonna do it in a year now, but I can probably do it today. And those are called three competitor segments. One is your incumbents. The incumbent are the companies that have been doing it for 20 years. Everybody knows their name. And in fact, in many cases, it may not be a company anymore because there's a thousand of them. It's now a technology. Maybe they're using this technology and your technology is gonna replace that in the future. Um, so for example, if you're gonna do AI that's gonna replace so, and you're going to do a, a SaaS model that's going to replace business processes in small and medium businesses. Your number one competitor in that market is probably Microsoft Excel. It is still the number one used software by small and medium businesses. And it's been out for 30 years and it's still small. Some small businesses, their entire back end's been bought, 
driven by an Excel spreadsheet. So that now becomes a, an incumbent competitor. If you're in social media, the incumbents today would be you know, Facebook. Okay? So the incumbent has been doing around for everybody. Everybody knows them. They're the dinosaurs in the industry. Then you got the new kids on the block that probably took what the incumbents do and they made a SaaS model out of it over the last three to seven years. And now they're online with the SaaS model and, and they're doing their thing. Then the competitors are really important are the ones that are just like you sitting in a meeting like this that you've never met and you don't even know who they are. But you're all going to come out of the door with your product in 18 months to two years and now you will be head-to-head -head competitors. So let's think about it like that. I can do it today, and I and here's where it's going. And again, this gets back to your vision. We see a future. So let's say, for example, we start off, I say, hey, we're going to do this. And as we said, we believe the future will be faster and predictable. Okay? We can define faster and predictive however we want. This is 100% sliding scale. This is 0%, 100%, 0%. So the future is gonna be faster and predictive. If we take a look at today, everybody knows these folks. They've been doing it forever. We've all probably used them. And you know they are by no means in the next generation of where things are going. They're based around reports. They by no means meet what we mean slower. And 90% of the time, your incumbents will in fact be 180 degrees from you because by default, they're, they've been around forever. They're not the leading edge of anything anymore. Now, then, so here's what the incumbents are doing. It they're doing here. Now, the new kids in the block, they took what the incumbents were doing, and they they brought technology in, took it online, and now it's much faster. They have brought communities together, but there's still no predictive analysis. There's no actionability out of it. Um, they're just generating reports of which we are, can make smarter decisions. We know of two companies that are next generation. One is employing AI to be very predictive and extremely accurate uh, because they're in the medical world. The other one we know about is going out consumer products. So they're not so concerned about being accurate and actionable with their predictions. They're more concerned about being faster. But we believe that if you're not bringing predictive, actionable, and faster into one place, that you're wrong. So what we're trying to say is this is where the market's going. And if you're not here, we think you're wrong. And that is more of a CEO discussion than our product's better. We've got yeses in the 13 blocks. None of our competitors do. Even though two of your competitors are two years ahead of you and already have deep pockets and so forth and so on. But that's a different story. So if you're going to do this method, use animation to walk them through what, what it is you're doing. Any questions on that? This is a key area for you to shine as a CEO and not just dive in on why your product's better. Why are you positioned in the marketplace to, to be able to co coexist? It's expensive to beat people. It's a lot cheaper to coexist. Any questions on competitive landscape and, and, and the CEO discussion? All right, well, that is all we have for today. And I know Hugh would love to talk about some of the events we have coming up. Is, is it possible to ask a question? This is Emily. Absolutely. I don't know if you answered it because I had to hop off and then my cancel got, um, I mean, I my answer it got pushed out. Uh, I was wondering, because typically um, investors ask you, like, what are you going to use the funds for? Uh -huh. And so um, for answering that, I, I tell them that I'm going to use the pr pr um the funds over like a 15 month period and um, to, to launch targeting um, uh, 50,000 subscriptions and with a 3 million um, ARR. But I'm thinking about changing that. Well, that's and not what you're gonna spend the money on. That's the goal you want to achieve. Oh, okay. Then this is how I changed it. I was going okay. to say that I was going to use a proceed, uh, um, use the funds over a fifteen month um, um, time period to launch 
um, targeting 50,000 subscriptions using 50% for sales and marketing, 30% for staffing, and 20% um, contingency. Okay. Can Again, I say that? Um, 15 months is your runway. So that's mm -hmm. now allows us to know how long it is. And then we can easily do the math on that and you can see what your burn rate is. So, uh -huh. okay. So you, it, it gives you a 15 month window, which is a reasonable window. Mm -hmm. And it's set to launch a given product. Um, you Correct. can also add to that what kind of thing. Are you going to bring any people on board or is the staff that you have going to be complete? Um, when are you going to start paid advertising? So there's a variety of things. Or are you going to do paid so advertising in this window? So there's more details you can add to that, but the percentages are, are, are fine. Okay, you the know. percentages are fine. Okay, okay. and I have details because I, uh, okay, so I could add details because I do have like my go-to-market strategy that has like all that information like mm -hmm. you know what type of team team members i i will be acquiring and and when i would be acquiring them and when i anticipate sure. but that's that's in your campaign. those are your financials that's just a detail of your monthly uh, finance okay what we really yeah. want to know what are you going to spend it on which okay. is like you said and then a lot of times the goals you're going to achieve like okay, okay. well all we're going to do here is we're going to build version one, we've got the MVP already launched right now. Your funding is to run the MVP for one year and then gather all the information that everybody told us on that. And then we're gonna incorporate that into our V2 or what's really gonna be our production system one. Okay. And yeah. that's what we're gonna fund. You're gonna fund production system one, which will have all the features or this or whatever. So it's more of a matter of where are you today and I give you the money, what's going to happen? The timeline is important there. Um, and there are percentages that people like to see. You're still going to be spending a lot of money on product and getting it right. And But now you're going to be introducing or a business and marketing and sales into it and operations and formality. Is that well, a true statement? Yeah. It, I was... Okay. I We're also... Um, getting ready to kick off our pilot our, our pilot sure, testing. Sure, sure. and so i i was thinking i was originally putting in there that i was going to use some of the funds to complete our pilot test our pilot phase but i didn't know if i should put that in there well you got to put in what you're going to use it for it, it okay. what you're talking is about you're trying to tell an investor what they want to hear rather than what okay. you're going to do okay and that'll always get you in trouble Okay, so I'll just yeah, don't worry about what they want to hear. Tell them where you are, what you're doing, because then that becomes real. So in the perfect world, here's mm -hmm. how an investor would look at your life cycle in the perfect world. Mm -hmm. One, the founders, you mm -hmm. and the founders funded the MVP. Mm -hmm. That could be 200K or whatever it took you to get a good quality MVP out there. Mm -hmm. Now, that MVP is going to probably run for about 12 months so you can figure out mm -hmm. what it really needs to be. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you're going to get funding to, for, so you can run it for those 12 months. So now mm -hmm. you got your first angel fund. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to run that for, let's say, 12 months, interview a bunch of people, understand what they want, incorporate the feedback, add the features that are missing. And 12 months down the road, you're going to come out with your V1 production mm -hmm. item. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. There's a lot of things that are going to happen that'll get you there. And then once that's done, you're probably going to go out now and get more money. To, mm -hmm. so that you can operate that B1 and, and then go up the hockey stick and so forth and so on and so on. Okay. So it, there's detail to that. Um, and it's different for everybody. But yeah, that's okay. a, one way to think about that. All okay. right, I'll just stick to my strategic plan, what, what I see us doing over that 15 yeah, months. Yeah, now- Laying okay. it out. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And and again, you know, uh, you know you're know, you free to reach out you know, to, you know, to us and touch base on that. 